Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Philosophy of Art and Science. Remember, if you want to support the video here and the audio of the Tawahedo Bible Study, go to patreon.com slash Tawahedo. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. And if you want to follow my newsletter, you can go to aksum.substack.com to go ahead and do that. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack dot com. Today, our special guest with us is Matthew Cooper. And maybe throughout this conversation, I'm going to pitch him to, to hop on Substack and start his own newsletter. Because uh, I, I remember I, I, uh, I've certainly read blog posts that he's had on his uh, heavy Anglo Orthodox, but I've been very inconsistent. And it's probably because I don't have it bookmarked. So it's probably whenever I saw it uh, posted on Facebook, but you can get directly to people's email boxes through newsletters, and then you can get some monetary re remuneration as well <laughs> of uh, $5 or, or more a month. But that all depends on, on your program. How are you doing today, Matthew? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Honey. Of course, of course. Now I'm I'm bringing Matthew on to the program, and I'm, I'm going to read this verbatim just to baffle our audience in, in the jump. He is a self-described left conservative realist pan-Eurasian weeb, and he is an orthodox Christian. And what's funny is like I identify in some shape, where form with a lot of these labels, but you know I, I don't necessarily use them. He's also an orthodox Christian but orthodox in the sense of right religion, in the sense of common kind of English parlance, he has what I would call heterodox views, which just means unconventional. Uh, it's not the thing that you mostly see on CNN and Fox News. And so I, I wanted to get him on here today, especially to give us maybe a survey of things in, in Russian history and Chinese history that that fascinate him whether it's kind of big arcs or any kind of individuals or 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 heroes and uh we're gonna just have an organic conversation and he's gonna uh, teach us all <laughs> about that today so you, you could really start anywhere and uh if 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 maybe you you could even start in how you got interested you know in history outside of uh the anglosphere that would be interesting too um okay sounds good i mean i I've largely been interested in the history of the Anglosphere for a really long time. Um, I, I mean, I've sort of long had this kind of sense of myself as being a, a kind of a patriot of the Anglosphere in a certain sense. So I got really heavily into English history. And then before that, um, the history of the Anglo-Saxons, the Celts, the, the Britons, um, and even the uh, kind of the pre-Celtic uh, tribes of, of Great Britain. Um, but it really, one of the things that really sort of opened my mind to how kind of small our kind of intellectual world was, was taking the Chinese language course during my first year at college, right? So here's a language that's in its written form, at least 3000 years old. And then it's, <laughs> and um, if, if you want to sort of stretch that a bit, it's a, it's a civilization that stretch back, stretches back even like 5,000 years. So for an American, where the oldest buildings that you see around you, and especially like for me, I'm from the East Coast, I'm from Rhode Island, right? The, so Benefit Street, the oldest buildings you're going to see there are going to be 400 years old in the 1600s, right? And we're talking about a civilization that's at least 10 times as old as that. Um, and that's, I mean... It's kind of mind blowing, actually, um, and it was certainly mind blowing to me when I first sort of encountered this um, really rich and ancient, like linguistic and philosophical um, civilization. Really, um, it's almost like going to an archaeological dig every week. It was it was really awesome. Nice. Um, was there something that prompted you to to pick it up? And is it Mandarin you learned first, or Cantonese, or so? Um, what kind of what kind of drew my interest to Chinese in, in the beginning was um, actually taking a high school course uh, on China, um, and then my teacher in in, uh, in college was Taiwanese, but she primarily spoke Mandarin. So in Taiwan, there are two main dialects of Chinese that are spoken. One is uh, just standard Mandarin, which is the kind of the northern Chinese uh, dialect. Um, it's spoken throughout China pretty much universally. Um, and then there's the Fujian dialect, which is the kind of the local, um, 
it's basically like the so Fujian is the region of China that's just across the strait from Taiwan. So most of the people who consider themselves Taiwanese mm -hmm. speak Fujian dialect, even though there are actually like Aboriginal indigenous people on Taiwan that speak a language that's completely unrelated to Chinese. Wow. So there's like this tripartite language politics in Taiwan that I'm, I'm not going to get into that because that's yeah. Like, how way how more is there a majority minority between those two? Are um, they on the same footing in terms of uh, demographic size? That's that's actually a really good question. You'd have to ask somebody who knows a lot more about Taiwan specifically. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding was that the Aboriginal people of Taiwan are a, a rather small minority, and they tend to be pretty conservative in their politics. That is, that they tend to support the Guomindang, the Nationalist Party. Um, whereas the people who speak Minnan, who were kind of the original like Chinese settlers yeah. on Taiwan, they tend to be much more liberal in their politics. They tend to be concentrated on the south of the island, and they um, tend to vote for the Mintindang, the the quote unquote democratic progressive part. Um, but it's like it's all suffused with language politics in very strange ways. Yeah, I had I had a Mandarin speaking friend in college. Um, he would only speak it with his mother. He was very interesting. He didn't like kind of advertising it. He was uh, he was half white, half Taiwanese, and uh, he was white passing. A lot of people didn't even know that he was talking because he was very much a surfer bro from LA. Yeah. And uh, but he was fluent. He was absolutely fluent in Mandarin. And I loved it every time he would talk. And, you know, he would kind of explain to me sometimes the relationship that they have with mainline China. And I didn't really understand the tension. Um, I knew there was something going on about like, is it a protectorate? Is it its own thing? I knew there's something there. It didn't hit me until I read Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And when I started reading him, he has a narrative in, in which he talks about how he was trying to get his book translated and printed over there. And because he referred to Taiwan as its own country, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, wanted to censor his book. And he, he said he'd rather not have it in print than it be censored. And so I remember, you know, he took a stand somewhere there. Whereas everybody else maybe would have seen the dollar signs and 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 shut up a little bit more, kind of like the the folks in the NBA have a lot of things to say locally, but when it comes <laughs> over yonder, they're they're a, a bit more quiet. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, Nicholas, yeah, uh, Justin Nicholas type is type is definitely a character, uh, <laughs> and I I do appreciate his uh, I do appreciate his zeal. That's, that's <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that is a really big kind of hot button political issue there. Um, I mean, my familiarity with China is, was built probably more both by, I mean, my wife is Chinese. Um, that helps. Then, was, but yeah, absolutely. It helps, especially with the language acquisition. Um, and then I spent um, probably a total of four years in China um, nice. doing various things. I worked at a fin uh, microfinance advising firm. Uh, which used to be called Planet Finance China, and then later was called Posit uh, Positive Planet China. Uh, I worked for the Inner Mongolia University of Science and Technology in uh, uh -huh. Balto, Inner Mongolia, which is not the same thing as the country of Mongolia, um, although there is a definitely a shared history there. Um, I was going to say, I saw recently on Twitter what, what they referenced as the raising of a black flag that might be a... Uh, like a like an ancient mongolian sign of war and i was like what is going on <laughs> i i wasn't sure what it was and so i you know i assume that the borders didn't fall down from heaven and so that there's going to be some some crossover there between some of the ethnic groups and i i know that personally from from the ethiopian situation a lot of people who don't know the horn of africa you know they see the all these different countries but like if you look at ethiopia eritrea Somalia and Djibouti and even Somalia really is three different states right now. But if you look at them, what is that? Four different countries on paper, but all of those ethnic groups can be found in Ethiopia. And yeah. so it's, uh, I, I, I'm not surprised, you know, the equivalent in, um, in Asia, in, in, in China there, that there would be people that would be perhaps ethnically Mongolian within the larger Chinese nation state. Is that, is that accurate? What you're saying? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. There's I mean, the the Chinese state loves to say this. The 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 communist state loves to say this that there are 56 ethnic groups in China, um, and they all live in harmony with each other. I mean, that's the propaganda <laughs> part. But, um, and there's there's some basis in reality for it, but it's really like they want to present their best face to the world, mm -hmm. um, and they do paper off over a lot of like very real problems. Um, but yeah, it's very similar. Like um, Ethiopia has this ancient like really long history. Like it's a civilization state, Ethiopia, right? Um, you've got the, I, I mean, your, your substack is, is named after the kingdom of Aksum, right? Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? So things like uh, the Qing dynasty actually did encompass all of Mongolia. It did encompass all of Xinjiang. It did encompass all of Tibet, right? So, and then when they designed the national flag in 1912, it was five colors for five different, peoples for five different mm -hmm. nations. You had the um, the Chinese Muslims, the Hui people, um, who were sort of at times conflated with the Uyghurs who are in the news most recently. Yes. Um, you've got the Mongolians, you've got the Manchus, the Tibetans, and then the majority Han people um, all represented in the national flag. That's and right. I've, I've met a couple Tibetans as well. And oh, that's, nice. that's a... Yeah. Another similar hot topic issue, oh, wow. along yeah. with uh, Hong, Hong, Hong Kong. Yep. Oh, wow. We've already managed to hit Taiwan, <laughs> Tibet, and Hong Kong on the show. Wow. This is not going to go over well in China. Let me put it that way. I've worn out my welcome already. Okay. Well, all, all <laughs> I have is I, all, I only know how to say ni hao ma, and hopefully that smooths it over. If that doesn't, I'll, I'll throw a xie xie, and that's all I have for you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Are you, are you listening, CCP? All right, we got this. Right? I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, but I mean, that's that's sort of how I sort of ended up uh, finding my interest in China and and sort of exploring that. Um, and that, of course, that's beautiful. I just, and you were conducting business in English while you were there, or in Mandarin. Um. So, I mean, I was teaching English over there. I was uh, I was an employee of the. Uh, IMUST, and they had me teaching not only English, but they also had me teaching Western history in China, which is also an interesting <laughs> dynamic. And they had me teaching out of this um, textbook, which was like, uh, well, it was a standard Chinese textbook. So it, it sort of presented everything from a dialectical materialist Marxist point of view, right? So I had to design my curriculum around this textbook. But the way that I ended up doing it was um, like every week I would sort of present the book's take on a particular period in Western history. And then I would sort of present an alternate view and ask the students to sort of decide for themselves, which they thought was more um, compelling, which one was more uh, convincing. That's and ballsy. Was, well, I mean, I was given a lot of leeway. I do have to okay. give credit to like the political officer at I'm at MUST and the and the administration there. They let me do my own thing, nice. um, and th they were mostly okay with it. So yeah, it's it's actually kind of fascinating. So in China, like they do have a lot. They're like Marxist discourse is everywhere in the in the official language and in the in the papers. But there's this kind of level where no one really believes it. No one really <laughs> like. It, it's a funny dynamic. Like you, like. Like people in the United States, when they say they're a liberal or they say they're a conservative, they like really hardcore believe it, right? They mm -hmm. really believe in that, like the Democratic Party really wants what's best for black people, or yeah. the Republican yeah. Party really wants what's best for ordinary people out in the rural areas, or that they really care about abortion, right? Um, in China, the the Marxist language is very much kind of a it's it's almost a veneer over a over. Um, Kind of a state ideology that's almost more like uh i would almost say like it's it's like american pragmatism or realism um there's definitely well, can you talk concern. about what that is we, we we mentioned that at the top what is realism you you know i and you, you said pragmatism as well are is realism and pragmatism the same thing and i guess the other kind of major option is idealism we could complicate it by talking about construction and things like that, but just oh, wow. in a basic, <laughs> in a basic yeah, sense, can you tell us what do you mean by uh, a realism? Just in case folks don't have the political science pedigree that you have. Um, okay, so uh, in international relations terms, uh, realism is the view um, first. First, um, 
first expressed by Thucydides, that individual states, individual polities, um, or governments that are, that are kind of independent, all advocate for their own interest on the international stage, and that the international stage is essentially governed by anarchy. And that's not the good kind of anarchy. That's the like Hobbesian state of nature kind of anarchy, a war of all against all. Um, and that nation states will seek to first um, ensure their own survival, um, ensure their own continuance, and if possible, expand their influence and enrich their people. Right. Um, so there is a sense in which realism is kind of a, a, a pretty pessimistic view of the world. Um, it's certainly at odds with the view of the world that sort of emerged in the 19th century in Britain and the United States that says, well, no, actually, nation states do, th there is an order among nation states that is driven by laws, um, that is driven by, by norms and certain behavioral expectations, diplomatic um, relationships, for example. Uh, and that's something that, I mean, speaking personally, uh, and speaking from my own personal observations, going back about, well, honestly, back to 2003 with the invasion of Iraq, um, I don't think that that's really, uh, I tend to think of that view of the world as being fairly naive, um, even though it's still the one that sort of tends to hold the most currency among Americans, both left and right. I, I agree with you. In the Ethiopian context, I was invited onto a, a larger program recently to discuss what is going on in Ethiopia. And right now, I don't know if you'd heard, there are Orthodox Christians in a less Orthodox Christian area who are, they're being murdered, slaughtered, whatever synonym you want to use. And so they asked me, the panel asked me, is it a genocide going on? And I said, let's retract. And I said, according to, you know, some of the base kind of tenets, definitional genocide, according to the UN, yes. But I told them personally, I recall my history well. I recall not only a pope that was blessing illegal, according to the global laws, a mustard gas, but also a League of Nations that not only ignored Ethiopia, but wanted to impose what they called equality by putting an arms embargo on both fascist Italy and that the word fascism is thrown out very you know, wantonly nowadays, but mm -hmm. that's the original fascist Italy. And right. they did an embargo on Italy who had their own arms production and little old Ethiopia who did not. And, and still we fought through that. So in my, in my, uh, agreeing with you, I rejected the definition of genocide in the first place. I don't think it's helpful. Like when people argue here between Turks and, and Armenians, and they try to get like um, the American le legislator to make some statement about genocide. It's like, to me, it's a farce the way that 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 you're describing it. The, these kind of uh, globalist machinations, and I have that background of Ethiopian history, and then also um, with you critiquing the Iraq War from the jump, which is why I I find people like Barbara Lee from uh, the Bay Area uh, one of the only, if uh, if I'm not mistaken, no votes on the Iraq war originally, like to be so courageous. And it's so crazy to me, like that people weren't rallying for her, you know, to be vice president. Like I didn't hear anybody mention her. I hear Susan Rice, Kamala Harris. I hear all these people. I heard nobody saying Barbara Lee. Yeah, she would have been awesome, quite frankly, Barbara Lee. Um, and if it weren't, yeah, and I, on the Republican side, there are definitely Republicans as well that I sort of have more respect for. Like even though my politics definitely tend more toward the left, uh, Republicans like Thomas Massey or Mike Lee, who really do kind of have this very strong understanding that you know there is a there is a machinery of there's an architecture of imperialism that they you know that they think is actually impoverishing Americans that they actually think is you know um, detracting from our quality of life in order to pursue these ideological um, projects in other parts of the world um yeah it's fascinating all the different allies that come when you critique empire i've, I've been a long time fan of uh, antiwar.com and um you know god rest his soul justin uh, 
uh, Raimondo used to be the editor over, over there for a long time. And, you know, they, they brought everybody, you know, I think even in their title, they said like pinkos and libertarians and conservatives and progressives, anybody who's willing to critique the military industrial complex. And I remember as I've been learning these things, you know, I was a kid at the time, so I don't remember it, but like Pat Buchanan's like campaigns in the early nineties and mm. how the Republicans kind of took over in 94, you know, st stuff that I, I read later. It's like, he was anti-war from a xenophobic perspective. And so it's so funny seeing like, you know, some people make a consequentialist or utilitarian kind of like, oh, it's not that efficient. And then some people make a moral ethical ar argument like, oh no, it's unjust. And then other people, like their racism draws them to be against empire. And I'm like, man, by any means, but that's kind of weird. It, yeah, agreed. <laughs> so, so that's, I, I guess, kind of um, some of the, the, the China stuff. Maybe you could tell us some of how you got interested in studying Russia and I'm, I don't know if that was how you got into orthodoxy, or I don't know, you could be a cradle too. I don't know if you're a cradle orthodox or, or how you got into that. So I converted in 2014, actually while I was living in China. Um, wow. Yeah, it, that's, a, that's an interesting story. So orthodoxy is not, does not have any legal standing in China. There are populations, including in Inner Mongolia, that do practice orthodoxy, including the indigenous Evenki people um, uh -huh. who are related to the Manchus, the, the ruling class of the last imperial dynasty, the Qing dynasty. Um, but currently there are only about like three or four functioning Orthodox churches in China, one of which is located in Beijing in the Russian embassy. And that's where I was um, chrismated in the, into the Orthodox church by Father Sergei Voronin. Um, my interest in Russia though, uh, that dates back to when I was, uh, doing some English teaching in Kazakhstan, actually. Um, Man, you've taught everywhere. I love that. Uh, well, I mean, a couple of places in Asia, but yeah. Um, and I've also been in Finland, but that was for a completely different uh, project. Um, the, the thing that really drew me to Russia were the, were the philosophical writings of a Kazakh poet um, kind of a kind of the national poet of Kazakhstan named uh, Abai Kunan Bayola, um, who wrote who wrote a book called the Book of Words, which consists of a section that's poetics, and then a section that's almost more aphorisms. Um, these very short, almost uh, uh, essays on kind of the examined life and the moral life and almost a kind of a uh, almost a kind of a cry from the heart for his people to improve themselves and he's um, a modernish poet or he's from a long time ago uh not from a very long time ago he was early 19th century i want to say okay. like the 1830s or 1840s um so he was contemporary with a lot of the original um populists in russia and he was friends in fact with uh, uh a certain Russian exile, a guy that was exiled out into Kazakhstan by the Tsar, named uh, Yevgeny Mikhailis. Um, and he had very left-wing politics. But but Abai Kunanbayola, he had this very, like, fr like, from this friendship that he had with this Russian revolutionary exile, right, uh, he developed a very strong appreciation for Russian literature, Russian culture, and even Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, wow. He was of a different religious faith at the time. I don't know what is dominant. I think all most people know in the United States is from the movie Borat, which is probably wildly inaccurate. Well, that's a funny thing. Like I could get into the weeds with you on Kazakhstani cinema. It is, uh, is its own culture and it is vibrant and it is awesome. Uh, I, I could, I could spend hours on that, but, um, and yeah, Borat is not very well loved. And no, Kabbalah. but but you're saying he would the poet was interested in Eastern Orthodoxy. But what was his sort of religious milieu? So he was a Sunni Muslim, uh, and he was very heavily influenced by the Sufi poets of Iran, especially. So like Rumi, Ferdowsi, um, uh, uh, um, Naziri, I think uh, as well, um, and. Uh, and that sort of that entire kind of um, 
direction in religious philosophical thought. And he saw a consonance there mm -hmm. bet between the kind of the spiritual freedom he saw being preached by these Iranian mystics, these very, I mean, these very like um, luminous uh, poetic mystics of, of the Iranian nation and the religious tradition of the Russian people that lived to the north. Um, and he, he expressed that in some very interesting and philosophical ways because like he, he he's definitely like a Platonist, right? He definitely mm -hmm. believes there is a truth out there, but that truth, you cannot approach that truth through, through platitudes. You can't approach that truth through the common places or through the, you know, um, I definitely you can't approach it through self-interest. It has to be, it has to be like a heart to heart inquiry. It has to be a conversation. It has to be a spoken word conversation between two people. That's where you find the truth. Um, and so the interesting thing about the Book of Words is that it reads as an act of self-exile. It is deliberately incomplete. He leaves you hanging. Right? <laughs> he is deliberately leaving the Book of Words as a set of questions to you, the reader. Right? It's very existential almost. Um, so I have this very deep appreciation for this, this Muslim poet who, had, who ended up leading me into Eastern Orthodoxy. Right? Um, so basically from there, I ended up getting this interest especially like the left wing of russian politics so and, like, and again the left wing and right wing we've said them a couple times today they're they're used so differently i mean just if you put prominent examples forward you know is left wing the you know is it the the mutualism and antifa is it Bernie Sanders and AOC? You know, is right. it Hillary? You know, uh, some people use liberal pejoratively. Some people use it positively and progressive and, and vice versa. I've seen so many different uses. I usually like to go back to where left and right originated in, in the French assembly. And I see Bastiat and Proudhon on the left, literally on the left side and mm -hmm. the right, you know, being the monarchy and the clergy. Um, but in the Russian setting that you're talking about, could you kind of tell us, you know, who who is left here and and who is right? Like, are they the the Bolsheviks or who who is it that you're referring to? Well, that, that's a that's a very interesting question, and I'm sure <laughs> that if you got three Russians in the room with you, you just the <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And this is speaking as a non-Russian. Okay, so yeah, take everything I say with a grain of salt here. But caveat, got it. Right. So like people like Nikolai Berdyaev and. Sergei Bulgakov, uh, uh, Maria Skopcova, the the kind of the nucleus of this philosophical movement in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century, um, most people would have considered them to be on the left of politics, all right? But they were advocating for um, a set of ideas and ideals that were inspired in large part so they break they break pretty hard this, this traditional like French sorry revolution. you cut out a little could you say that again they they were inspired in large part by what so um Nikolai Berdyaev especially and Sergei Bulgakov they were advocating for an for a, a unified society that was that was kind of inspired by the European Middle Ages right so they wanted to see uh, kind of the, the, the peasants and the artisans, the, the workers kind of band together and, and sort of have a, and sort of in kind of a mutualist, anarcho-syndicalist um, community. There's a, there's a specific Russian word for it, sobornost, um, which is often used in religious terms to refer to the kind of, uh, equality of the bishops and the the unity of thought of the bishops, the doctrinal uh, agreement and brotherly um, brotherly accord of the bishops. It's an active self giving, and this is a very idealistic sentiment. And obviously, with the state of the Orthodox Church right now, we can say it's probably more honored in the breach than in the observance. But um, <laughs> there was this. There was definitely this idea that came from the that, that original that originated on the russian right the 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 slavophil movement 
which was a reaction against Western ideas and, and sort of a call back to the uh, to autocratic monarchy in a certain way. But mm -hmm. they had this, this idea at the center of a mutualist syndicalist society that was based on the peasant commune or the artisan commune in the cities um, that migrated in a certain way onto the, onto the populist movement or the, the Narodnik movement which was firmly on the left and which was firmly against the kind of the old order or the autocracy. Anti-Tsar. Um, anti, well, yeah, anti-Tsar. Uh, there were definitely, there were even like terrorists who, they, they, they actually killed Alexander II and they tried to kill uh, Nicholas II at several times. They had several assassination attempts. And uh, one of the big projects of this core group of, early 20th century Russian thinkers was the way to, okay, so how can we, how can we act on this core, this, this Christian idea of brotherhood in an economic sense, in a, in a sense of we're freely giving of each other to the community and we're freely receiving what we need. Um, we're not driven by profit. We're not driven by, um, we're not driven by greed. We're driven by love for each other. There was this. There was this idea in, at the core of this of this movement, but they were trying to reconcile it with uh, kind of the traditional forms of governance. They like they saw the Bolsheviks, and they were, I mean, they, they thought that the Bolsheviks were trying to take ideas from the West and graft them willy nilly onto the Russian state in a way that would never work. So you look at the you look at this the the. Uh, compilation of essays that they produce called Landmarks. Um, the, at, there is a definitely a very like egalitarian ideal there, but it's very anti-Bolshevik in a certain way. Um, but so that's yeah, what so I mean, because because a, lot a lot of people, people a lot of people would call them, them, for example, for example the, left. the left. When I, when I analyze these kind of groups, I think I would, you know, I, I look at again that original left-right assembly and it just looks like you know they wanted to replace the czar and be the the secular czar. So it seems like they would also be right, but nobody <laughs> wants to call like you know Stalin and stuff like on the right. So I, I I don't know if you are on my page in in saying that the group that you would support more the I don't know the Russian word. Sub, sub, it sounded like subordinate almost. <laughs> How do you so say the, it? So the, the the technical term the term for the ideology is subordinist. Then the, the, subordinate. the people that sort of had this idea they were called the Narodniks, the, the populists. The right. populists. So the populists. it seems like I would say the populists are definitely left of the Bolsheviks. I don't know if that's something you would agree with, but it seems for whatever reason, that's not how a lot of people use it in, in normal discourse. Well, actually, it's very interesting that you say that because uh, I've been doing a bit of reading about uh, from a, um, I don't know where he was originally from. I think he's from Egypt. Uh, a Marxist scholar named Samir Amin, who died a couple of years ago, ago i think uh and, he re and i think he retired to senegal um but he critiqued the soviet system uh, basically from the left saying that the mode of production in the soviet union was not it did not fundamentally change the relationship between the state and the people it did change the relationship between the market and the people um but not in the way that most like Marxists would sort of see as ideal, right? So there is a language of state capitalism that is used to critique states like the Soviet Union and nowadays China, right? Um, that's generally put forward by the Trotskyists, right? Yes. Um, they basically yes. say, well, these, these states, they're not real socialist states. They still have hierarchies. They still have, you know, uh, money. There's no they true Scotsman, have haven't you heard? No true Scotsman, yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely like an argument that Samir I mean, wanted to get away from, but at the same time, he didn't want to kind of legitimize these uh, structures that hadn't, in his mind, really grasped the central um, the central goal of what he saw as the as the left project of of you know brotherhood and unity and sort of getting rid of the predatory nature of economic interactions or at least ameliorating it to some extent so what he did was he didn't call it state he didn't call it state capitalism he also didn't call it 
socialism. He called it the Soviet model of production, <laughs> which is very neutral, very studiedly neutral. But at yeah. certain point, I think it's getting at the same point that you're getting at as well, that it's like they still had a hierarchy. They still had a, you know, a, a, a state that was almost like a red czarism uh, in a certain sense. Yeah. I think the question is, not, you know, where do they say they want to go? Because I think a lot of those people, um, you know, they say they want to get to this place where it is more bottom up. The question is, what does the transition to there looks like? And even Noam Chomsky, I think, has gotten into some trouble in presenting his view of anarcho-syndicalism, for example, whenever he's pushed on, well, what's the transition period look like? And it always, it almost always goes back to like a giant state. So, you know, when you have like the name anarchy in it, but like the transition period has got to be this, you know, um, you know, I certainly am no fan of, of Ronald Reagan as a lot of uh, people are not, but one of the funnier things that he said that I think rings true is that the closest thing to eternal life on earth is a temporary government program. And so I, I, I do wonder what that, um, you know, how do you, how do you get to the transition? The, the populists you're talking about, uh, did, do they want to seize the various means of productions or how is it that they wanted to get to their world? Did they want like the SAR to still be there for just like national defense and then every other field of production kind of is owned by the workers? Or I, I'm wondering how did they, you know, envision kind of if they're if they won you know what does that look like <laughs> a counterfactual yeah, yeah i mean I, I made the joke before and it still applies like if you put three populists in the room you get four different answers to this question right yeah so there's a there's a book that's on my bookshelf right here that's oliver radke's the sickle under the hammer and it talks about um it talks about precisely this populist movement especially in the early 20th century when they were at odds with the bolsheviks and part of the reason that they failed they the, the populists had massive support. They were the most popular party in Russia under wow. the transitional government, right? Alexander Kerensky was a populist, right? Um, but like they were overthrown by the Bolsheviks in part because they didn't have a very structured plan of how to get from point A to point B. So you had people like uh, uh, the blessed saint uh, Ilya Fondominsky who were basically saying what you were saying, he wanted to keep the czar for national defense purposes, but basically devolve all of the other powers of government toward the people. Um, and then you had people like in the middle, like Alexander Kerensky, who were just trying to keep everybody together. And then on the far left of the party, left, I'm using this. Um, on the, on anti czar I think I got, I got, I got it. <laughs> right. on, the, on the extreme part of the party, you basically had the people who were saying, you know, we need to overthrow the entire system of government. We have to overthrow the entire monarchy we have to get we have to get out of world war one we have to return to the we have to return all of the power to the people um and i mean eventually those people would end up going out of the populist party and into the bolsheviks i was just going to guess that it seems like those people because they're more tied because it's all about the strategy and tactics about how to get to the world you want to see that they would make some sort of cross ideological alliance and then just move over like i remember reading a book years ago right because it used to bug me i used to i remember asking my dad when i was like 10 what's liberal and conservative because i saw it on a billboard and he just told me to like look it up in the dictionary he wouldn't give me an answer and so i remember just like learning all these different definitions and i'm like i don't know what is what anymore especially when i i read older old older stuff you know um like uh who is it like the Republican Robert Taft in American history, the um, who's the major guy, oh God, one of the richest people on earth, his father and his son are both kind of like that. His father's one of the so-called old right. Uh, no, no, no. He's alive right now. He like lives on a farm, made okay. a lot of money off the state tax. Um, help me out. Name some billionaires. Well, like Warren Buffett. Yeah. Warren Buffett, his father. Okay. His father was a part of, his father was a senator, friends with Robert Taft. One of these people who, you know, you could call the old right, who people would pejoratively call like the isolationists, like those people yeah. who were against kind of the world wars and stuff, um, but from the Republican side. But anyway, th all this to say the word conservative kept shifting. And one of the books I read early on that kind of described this for me, 
trace the history of the neoconservatives mm -hmm. and how I think if I'm not mistaken, if I'm remembering properly, like they were Trotskyites and they moved slowly to being these conservative, but really neoconservative Republicans. And yeah. then now, for example, in critiquing Trump on the Republican side, you see this weird alliance of like George W. Bush and Bill Crystal and Biden. And you're like, wait, didn't you guys hate each other? Like what's going on? <laughs> it's like, no, it's a cross ideological alliance, like you said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, did they actually hate each other though? Because like Biden was a big supporter of the Iraq war. And that's one of those things that we're not talking about right now because it's inconvenient, right? Um, and then the whole idea about the Lincoln Project and the basically critiquing from, from the right on China, for example. Um, it's, a, it's a really hard world out there for those of us who don't really fit into a political mold, or at least like, like a pre-made political mold in the sense, like, are we a Democrat or are we a Republican? These things are basically like containers. They're empty containers, and, you, and various interest groups sort of put their put their kind of preferences into them uh, in kind of haphazard ways, it almost seems like. Um, That's right. But yeah, whether major you're a candidate. Sorry, go ahead. What were you saying? It's like, yeah, well, whether you're a libertarian or whether you're a green or whether you're like off the political spectrum entirely, it's it's very difficult to find a political home, I think. Yeah, they either want you to hate China or Russia, which is why I think it's interesting for us to humanize both of those places, not that we're sycophants of the regimes there, but I wanted to invite you on to kind of humanize by telling, you know, a, just very brief, I mean, this is so brief forays and surveys into some of their period and and some of the kind of interesting uh, arrangements. But you, you did mention the kind of modern situation, American situation. I know you got a hard out coming out soon. Before we get out, maybe we can bring it into the kind of current situation um, that we're in. When when we see this xenophobic language, and not just language, but actions, right? Like, you know, uh, embargo on TikTok and whatever the parent company is, and you know, try to promote a World War Three, like like die trying to preserve this conspiracy theory with with Russia. We, it seems that on either side, like, again, the Republicans want us to hate China, the Democrats want us to hate Russia, and I'm not quite convinced that we need to hate either. I'm not convinced that our Federal Reserve note is going to uh, last much longer, and maybe, maybe uh, their currencies are going to uh, take over. W what's your sort of um, uh, general assessment of, of um, you know, the various things that have been in the news, I'll let you take it any direction you want, whether it's the domestic America and, and how they want us to view Russia and China, or whether it's stuff that's in Belarus or Yemen or, or Syria. Well, I mean, one of the things that like, um, one of the things that I just sort of want to talk about a little bit is definitely, I mean, you can't go wrong with humanizing people. You just can't go wrong with sort of bringing that personal dimension into the conversation. And I think that that's really what helps to deflate a lot of the political lies that we're caught up, caught up in right now on both sides, right? So whenever I talk about China um, online, uh, or whenever I, talk, whenever I talk about China online, I, obviously the first people that I think about are my wife and my kids and my, and my in-laws. I mean, they're, they're really kind of the, um, the faces that I have to see every day. Mm -hmm. um, and like they're the people that have to deal with this political environment in ways that I never have, never will have to because of the color of my skin and because of the way that I present myself, the way I speak. Um, but then I also think about the people that I worked with in China. Um, one of my co-teachers, Vivian, uh, who just really lovely woman, uh, she was a little bit younger than I was. Um, she got pregnant about in the middle of the way through the year and then married her boyfriend right after that. Um, uh, but she had the most interesting takes on Chinese history and on Chinese politics. And the fact that she was willing to discuss them with me in English was a real, like, 
I, I, I still, I still kind of in a little bit of awe about that because <laughs> Chinese people, they, they don't really open up to outsiders, uh, especially about politics. It's something that you discuss at the dinner table. It's not something that you discuss at work, right? Um, in Russia, it's the same way. They have this they have this idea of the you know kitchen table politics, the things that you're allowed to say to your family, but you don't go out in public and say them, right? Um, and that's like a holdover from Soviet times. I was just going to say the fear of people using something against you to turn it in. the yeah. the red there's a red terror in Ethiopia, and so there's a similar th there's a similar culture of that. But I would say it also goes back to the ruling class culture. And with the monarchies of these places that I think that there has always been a level of court intrigue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, in China, that the history of that goes all the way back to like before Christ. I mean, the, the first the first empire in China was founded in something like 221 BC. Uh, like it's still like his household name in China, Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China, literally. Um, and his, I mean, he basically, like his policy was uh, burn the books and bury the scholars. I mean, that wow. was his like, landmark policy, um, as well as building the Great Wall um, in order to keep out the Northern barbarians. And we, we, know, how the, how, we know how well that turned out, don't we? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, like, is that, is that why Trump didn't actually build the wall? <laughs> well, uh, good question, right? <laughs> is it actually working? Because is that the 7D chess? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. But um, yeah, like, like bringing this back around to Vivian, though, like she was definitely kind of the face of Chinese politics that I got to see. And her understanding of China was, it was very like on PC. It was very not politically correct. She was definitely not like a diehard Communist Party supporter, but her takes on world affairs and her takes on um, kind of modern Chinese culture as well we're very grounded in this kind of familial sense of like the, like the Chinese people are a big family, you know? Um, and in this very traditional sense of, well, uh, we all kind of have roles that we need to, that we need to fulfill. And if we fulfill them well, then we've done a good job in terms of being political agents. Uh, I think, I mean, that's, that was really what kind of Confucius was getting at um, going back to sort of the ancient, philosophy behind that. But um, there definitely is in China a sense of cultural belonging that they're, they're definitely not Western. Like the, the politics of China, even if China was to become a democracy tomorrow, China would not be a Western society. It would not, it would not look like Sweden or Norway, right? And I think that that's what a lot of people want China to become. Um, it's not, it's never going to be that. Um, just the same way like Thailand is never going to be that same way that South Korea is never going to be that. Um, but, you know, at the same, and at the same time, like Chinese people really do support at least for now, the, the Chinese communist party in power, largely because they've succeeded at this pragmatic level, right? Not, not because of any ideological preference for Marxist, Leninist, Maoist thought, right? But because they've actually been able to deliver on a lot of the promises for, you know, uh, basic standards of living for a lot of people. And, uh, and, and certainly, like you mentioned, the critique that some people lay, and again, capitalism is one of those extra loaded words, right? Is it the yeah. status quo? Is it some perceived world? People have so many different definitions. It's originally a Marxian word of critique of the status quo kind of system, but people use it in so many different ways. And that's actually where I defer from a lot of people. That's, that's why I've always identified kind of with, I, I got fascinated via Ron Paul with the system of Austrian economics, but I've never been quite tied to libertarianism per se as a principle. And um, more and more, you know, I, I, I tend to like the history and especially some recent people who've been lying about the kings. I used to be the number one critic of the Ethiopian kings, but certain people have just been blatantly lying that I found myself becoming the, the advocate and defender of the kings. And I've been translating some documents and, and things like that too, just to kind of show, um, you know, some of the diaspora youth, like have access to these primary sources, learn your, your, your language. So that's, that's very interesting that you were able to, to get that from them and that, you know, 
this Western imposition is not something you think is uh, happening anytime <laughs> uh, soon over there. But but people have laid that critique of uh, they're opened up sort of selectively um, the the market processes, and that's what you're referring to when you say their pragmatism. Yeah, um, I mean that, that was like it, there was there was nothing really like uh, sinister or hidden about it even like the, Deng Xiaoping was very open about his his uh, selective appropriation of market norms, for example, um, and his you know his reduction of price price settings and things like this, uh, uh, his household responsibility system, which kind of semi privatized property. Um, do they still have those long of, those long yeah. leases? I actually had uh, I don't know if you know uh, he actually had, carries a Chinese moniker, but he's not Chinese. Uh, that's Mencius Moldbug. So he's popularized at yeah. least uh, people looking into Mencius more, if that uh, delights you. And <laughs> and he mentioned when I told him that the CCP's older policy was copied in Ethiopia of ninety nine year leases. He told me that yeah. they had ninety nine and potentially nine hundred ninety nine year leases where people own the house but not the property or the land underneath. Is that I don't know if that's still a thing. Yeah, that's actually like all land is owned by the state, and the state leases it out for a certain period of time. I mean, and the the leases are indefinitely renewable. So, like once you run to the end of that ninety nine year lease, it's not like oh we're going to take your house from you. But um, it's still like the, the the government owns that land, and they can do with that land what they want. It's it's basic. It's almost like a warding off any critique of like eminent domain usage or things like that. But yeah, that's definitely still the case there. That's so funny. So uh, th this has been uh, an absolute pleasure. I I know you have to go. We'll we'll let you have any sort of uh, final thoughts, and then make sure we plug your your blog again. And if you have any other okay. projects you want to plug, make sure to to plug those. And know that you're you're welcome back to do any deep dives, whether it's on the original Mencius or Confucius or the Kazakhstani <laughs> poet or Dostoevsky or, or Tolstoy, anything religion, politics, language, and especially the intersection of, of all three of those things. So whenever you have time, you can let me know too and, and go ahead and plug any projects you have or anywhere you want, anything you want anyone to read or, or do. Sure. Um... Well, again, thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoy talking about these things face to face, even though we're not really in the same space. But um, yeah, uh, so yeah, so please do check out my blogs, blogs, plural, right? Um, I've got the Heavy Anglo Orthodox and also another project called Silk and Chai. It's at silk, A N D, chai, C H A I, dot info, I N F O. Um, it's another blog. It's dedicated primarily toward geopolitics and uh, world systems theory. Um, and that if you're if you're a fan of like uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein or Samir Amin or Janet Abulugo, definitely give that a check out. Um, I've got a couple of articles in the Rule of Faith magazine, which is an Eastern Orthodox publication that's uh, recently come out uh, with a couple of issues. Um, just want to give that a plug for my for my friends over at, at Rule of Faith, Joseph Lucas and Father John Cox. Father Joseph Lucas and Father John Cox. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I wish that we had more time so I could do some book recommendations. But uh, the book that I'm reading right now, I uh, just want to give this one, one a shout out, is With Dare Sue the Hunter. Um, it's a, it's an it's a biography of Dersu Uzala, who is a who is an Udige trapper in uh, the northeast of China and the far east of Russia, the, where those two kind of coincide. And it's it, it's very it is a very evocative book. If you love nature writing, if you love travel logs, if you love biographies of really good and decent and humble human beings, this is the book for you. Um, with Their Sue the Hunter by Vladimir er Vladimir Arsenyev. Um, Perfect. It was made into go, go ahead and send me send me the links, and I'll throw them up on the YouTube too. Absolutely, yeah. And they actually made this book into a movie by Akira Kurosawa, um, oh. which is also worth checking out because there is so much like premonition of Star Wars in this movie that it like any geek would just get a thrill out of it. 
I was, I was going to say, I, I never, we never got to it. I was going to ask you because I grew up from 2003 to the present on reading manga and, and anime. And Weeb, I thought, was always for people who are Japanophiles. I didn't know it, it included China. I didn't know, it, but, but are you, I don't know, you're a Japanophile as well. Is that allowed? <laughs> uh, Pre-1868. After 1868, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Understood. I know you got to go now, but uh, make sure, yeah, make sure you 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 send me those links, and I'll throw them up and let you know when this is all posted. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Hannah. No problem. Peace. Peace.